we're going to remember this the rest of our lives, you know? One of those defining moments in your life when you think about something all your life as a kid and you're finally here. It's hard to imagine we're here, but we'll remember this like we remembered uh, Kennedy, man landing on the moon. Today is October 22nd, 1997. It's 2.33 in the afternoon and my kids at home in Brockton and Hanson are 2.30 in the morning. My name is Dick Oso, and I'm the planetarium director at Brockton High School. Right now, I'm somewhere over the Pacific Ocean on my way to visit China. This documentary is my story about a unique, once-in-a-lifetime trip with 25 other professional astronomers, educators, and planetarium directors. You'll get to follow us through 16 days of unforgettable experiences. But I suppose a little background of how all this came about would be helpful. I've been a teacher at Brockton High School for 28 years. My passion was always astronomy as a kid. When teaching became my choice, I jumped at the chance to work at Brockton because they had built a planetarium at their school. Eleven years ago, I took charge of running it. It's one of the many opportunities available to our students. In the spring of 97, I received a letter from the executive director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, Dr. Robert Havlin. His letter to me was an invitation to become a team member of a delegation going to China. The trip was put together by the Citizen Ambassador Program of People to People. While reading this letter with all the places they would be visiting, I thought back to all the images I'd ever seen of China. 
Someday, I thought, if there was some way to go, I'd love to see the Great Wall, the Forbidden City, the Tomb of the Clay Warriors recently discovered in the city of Xi'an. But before I had finished the letter, I realized there were a lot of obstacles that I had to overcome. For one, the trip was in October. It would mean 11 school days, and with the school going into a block schedule for the first time, I really wasn't sure whether they could or would let me go. Besides that, I had to pay for the trip myself. I shook my head at the price tag, over $4,600, and I still had to get from Boston to San Francisco, as well as any spending money. Oh well, it would have been great. I was about to rip up the letter when I stopped. Maybe I should just ask a few people first. I was surprised when everyone at school I spoke to said that's the kind of trip the school would and could support. Hey, I started to get excited. My next surprise came when I brought up the letter and the trip to my wife, Vi. I tried to say everything and show the least bit of excitement I had because it was so expensive. She said to me, go, we'll find a way to pay for it. How about that? When I'm wondering how we can afford it, she's telling me to go. Going to China now seemed like a real possibility. The next day I told my class, and I realized that not only is China on the other side of the world, but most of us will never get there. The China we all knew was changing. And I had a chance to tell a story about a place so very different and half a world away. Now, for the past 12 years, I've been producing and directing an outdoor TV show called New England Rod and Reel with Don Sani. With all those years of TV experience, why don't I bring the equipment along with me and show everyone the China that we saw? On the last school committee meeting in May, I made my presentation. They voted unanimously to let me go. Now I was getting nervous and excited all at the same time. It looked like I was going to go to China. Besides taking a TV camera, I had planned to take a lot of slides for a planetarium show. And that's when I realized I couldn't do it all. I needed to take a cameraman to help me out. I had the right person to go, but getting the time away and the expense of the trip may be too big an obstacle even for him. My choice was Bob Bellavo, a TV program director for the company Media One from the town of Cohasset. He had the right sense of adventure besides being a funny guy. He and I had worked on several video projects and this would be the grandest of all. I spent the entire summer trying to get sponsors for the trip, basically to get funding for a cameraman. By August I had secured enough funds from the wonderful sponsors you see at the beginning of this program to cover most of the equipment costs. One individual stepped forward and didn't want any publicity and wrote out a check to cover the cost of Bob's ticket. My cameraman was going to China. The idea of going to China alone is just exciting because of what is actually happening over there. The development, the, the sea of humanity that lives there, the kinds of things that happen with China that are in the forefront of our media today. Wow, what an opportunity to go to something and see something like this, this kind of diversity, this kind of scope and scale. Uh, and then to have it funded. Whoa. I, I was in awe, really truly in awe of what this would mean and, and how I can be a part of it and what kind of impact I can help and, and make on this kind of an adventure. When it became apparent that uh, Bob Beliveau was going to go with me to China, there was a lot of uh, relief on my part because I had spent the entire summer trying to get uh, uh, sponsors to help out and uh, allow me to take a cameraman and, and I was glad Bobby was able to go because now, uh, and I'm not comfortable with this, but I would be in front of the camera, and I usually don't do that kind of thing. But uh, Bob was along to help me shoot some slides, shoot video, uh, and basically take and keep a lot of notes as to what we're going to do on this trip. This uh, journey that we're making to China with our delegation is, is really a two-week trip, and uh, there have been a lot of people who've had concerns about going to China, and I had them myself, uh, big bad China, uh, China on the other side of the world. Uh, I, I want everybody to understand that this is just a small story. We're basically going to follow uh, where we went for two weeks, uh, the people that we met, the universities, the, uh, the astronomical observatories, the kids, the people that we met. This has nothing to do with human rights. That's a whole different issue. It's a whole different story. Uh, we're going as educators to see and find out how they teach astronomy. So please keep that in mind. San Francisco is one of these places in the United States, in my opinion, everybody ought to go visit. 
it's, an, it's, it's a tremendously alive city. It's bright. It's so positive. You can't help but come away feeling just how positive this city is and, and what kind of pride these people who live there take in their city. It's exciting. It's, uh, it's very alive. Uh, it's got a tremendous amount of diversity in it. And you can see that with uh, the, 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 the filming of television shows that goes on in there, the history, the culture, the attitude. Um, it, it's just so alive. It, it, it's tremendously impressive. And then the Golden Gate outshadows all of it. One of the one of the things that I had planned uh, uh, before this trip was that we were going to spend a day before we left for China and a day we came back from China to uh, see some things in San Francisco. I mean, if you're going to go all that way, you might as well see what is out there. And uh, for those of you who've never been to San Francisco, and you really should, uh, first of all, San Francisco is a lot like Boston. Uh, we have boats in the harbor and so forth, but uh, obviously San Francisco has the hills, and uh, you need to come out here and see it. Uh, we drove along the, the harbor way and stopped under the bridges and, and uh, stopped along a lot of the, the tourist stops. Uh, we did, in fact, see uh, two production companies doing uh, episodes, uh, scenes from Nash Bridges. Standing downtown on the harbor, on the water, and to take a breathtaking view of the Golden Gate Bridge, literally in the fog, and then to see something come under the bridge as we're standing there, and it's a four-masted bark, you know, ship of one of the, t it's one of the tall ships in the world. There are not many of these left, and to see this entering the harbor, and all the men standing on the side rail dressed in dress whites, and Dick and I are just standing there, and it's just, you know, this is a moment. This is just one of those things you're in the right place at the right time. It was just a great sight. One of the nice things about crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, obviously, uh, we timed it just perfectly. Uh, the gods were watching us that day because uh, the half the bridge was covered in fog and the other half was clear. And driving across the bridge, we would go in and out of the fog and eventually come to the other side where most people who do visit the bridge, uh, there's a tourist area that you can get out. And it is. It's very nice. It's very pretty. Uh, you get a great view of the bridge and the mountains to either side. And of course, you look across the bay to San Francisco. But about 10 years ago, when I had been to San Francisco myself with my wife, we managed to find a road that takes us underneath the bridge and actually go up a pretty uh, tall hill to the side where there's an old fort. And most people don't even know how to get there. Uh, and that's the place I recommend you go because we were able to drive higher and higher up and eventually we get above the fog and uh, as you can see the photographs just looking at half the bridge in the fog with the top half sticking out in the city of San Francisco again it's the place where most of these posters and postcards are actually photographed when everyone thinks of San Francisco you almost can't escape thinking about earthquakes and now with the Pacific Ocean warming with El Nino heavy rains produce massive mudslides so not only does this hill outside of San Francisco provide us with great scenic views but it shows the powerful forces that shape the surface of the earth. These sedimentary rocks are greatly deformed as the continent is slowly shifting. These rock layers were once made flat and horizontal. Today, they are bent and fractured. Each time they slip, it's an earthquake, and when water gets under its surface, the dirt loosens and gravity may begin a mudslide. You know, the East Coast really doesn't seem so boring after all. understand is that the road that we took, it's the first exit, Alexander Road, right off the side. And if you take that right hand turn, you end up coming up on this road that leads us all the way to the top. So if you're ever planning to San Francisco, you're going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge, forget that tourist drop, get on this Alexander Road, it takes you all the way up to the, uh, to the port, which gives you the view that you just saw. 
Um, I had a surprise for Bob because a neighbor of mine who uh, is in the business uh, managed to get us a personal tour of uh, Skywalker Ranch and uh, it was fun all day long to watch Bob uh, uh, literally salivate at uh, perhaps the world's best recording studio for sound and, and uh, picture. And uh, the thing that impressed me among everything else was the fact that uh, they were putting the finishing touches on the movie Titanic. But uh, Bob had a ball. I certainly enjoyed it. But uh, it truly is one of the best uh, facilities in the world. The whole day, starting from Golden Gate Bridge and going further forward, you know, coming off of a busy time and a busy week and a busy life, and then bang, you're out on a vacation and you're going on a new adventure. And then you start out at the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it, you know, this is really the start of one hell of a trip. Then you go north and we go to Skywalker Ranch. And Skywalker Ranch is one of these places in life that in the video and the film and television business, you want to see the pinnacle. You want to see where this is where all the magic happens. It's, it's a Spielberg, it's George Lucas, it's Industrial Light and Magic, and this is the audio division of that. This is where all the audio is put to film. It is the pinnacle of this kind of domain. And here we are walking around, and you see, as you walk into the ranch itself, this magnificent plantation home where the offices are, there is Indiana Jones's hat. There's his whip. There's the gold uh, the statuette in the bag of sand where he put it on the foundation, sitting right there in a cabinet. And you begin to think about, this is really cool. And then you leave there and you go over to where the actual production facilities are and you're just so in awe walking in and realizing it's a very tranquil setting, literally between the mountains. There's sheep, there's cows, there's beautiful vineyards. And then when you walk in into this magnificent movie theater in Orchestral Sound Hall where George Lucas, uh, where John Williams brought the, um, the London Symphony Orchestra to, to record all the audio with a full symphony in this hall. It's just magnificent. And then you go into the, the, the two movie theaters where they score everything, and, and it is so quiet and so sound-walled and, and insulated and padded, you can hear your heartbeat standing in the middle of this place. And then to think about the fact that, gee whiz, there's nine guys as we're looking through this glass, there's nine guys sitting there scoring all of the audio to the movie Titanic. Whoa, this is the pinnacle of audio production facilities. There's 102 channel input boards standing there right in front of us, and it takes nine to 13 people to work on this thing, to, to reach the pinnacle of audio sound production. And I, I really was so fired up and charged coming out of this. I, I, the rest of the trip was at that level. I mean, to start at this level to begin with and realize, oh, okay, well, for me personally now, I had to match this. I, I wanted to make sure that I'm going on this adventure with these people. I wanted to make sure that all of my efforts were going to be as good as what I just saw. And it really brought me up to a different level. And that, frankly, is still with me today. Now, on the way back from Lucas Skywalker Ranch, again, one of the impressive things is that it was later in the afternoon and the, the, the beautiful day that we had, all the fog had uh, disappeared. And so we had to go back up to the top of the mountain. The, the yin and the yang, which is what China was all about, we wanted to see exactly what we saw in the morning, but without the fog. And we had an absolute crystal clear day, as you're seeing. Uh, beautiful view of San Francisco. And off to our left, we could see Alcatraz, which is where we're going to stop at the end of our trip. That night, we were going to meet everybody for the first time, the other 25 members of our delegation to go to China, and they were made up of uh, literally college professors, uh, educators, and other planetarium directors. And we're all in the same boat. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I know Bob and I are sometimes off the wall uh, in terms of fool around, goof around, have a good time. Uh, we just didn't know how serious everybody was going to be or whether or not we were going to have fun with this. And as it turns out, uh, everybody was a little standoffish at first, but uh, as the evening wore on, uh, uh, we certainly had tried to loosen everybody up and we really had a good time. And these were some outstanding people. Uh, when you reading in the newspapers of various uh, discoveries that are made, some of these people, their names are, are there because they're the ones that are doing the cutting research. So. Uh, as a school teacher, as a planetarium director from Brockton, uh, this was uh, 
a tremendous experience for my part as much as Bob loved Skywalker Ranch but for me to rub elbows with these people who are actually doing this research and to bring that back to my kids in the classroom I thought that was pretty spectacular. As a guest of this delegation I was really quite nervous about meeting a lot of these people there. They're brilliant educators, they're brilliant professors, brilliant people in their, in their own realm of astronomy, astrophysics, the, the, the earth sciences. I mean, these people all have such a broad, diverse scope of astronomy education. And I sort of bringing myself at the point of, well, gee whiz, I'm just a lowly video producer. Well, I'm not. I mean, obviously, uh, it brought me up a couple of notches to listen to the intellect that's being discussed here, listen to um, uh, every single word that's coming out of these people's mouths, understanding what is being uh, um, done here. And as a producer, uh, that's my job. That's what I do for a living. And this really made me step up a couple of notches because I didn't want to miss a word of what was being said, thought of, and inflected uh, as I am looking through the lens of the camera with this. And I was so proud to meet these people and really just had a magnificent time knowing them and understanding um, what, their, what their science is. What, this is their gig. And I am helping them uh, show it to the rest of the world. And this was really cool. Whoever likes a 13 to 15 hour flight, um, I really didn't know what to expect. The um, longest flight I think I ever had was six hours and someone said to me, you know, you're going to need one of those inflatable collars uh, because there's no place to sleep or to stretch out and your neck's going to hurt. So I bought one, I told Bob to buy one and boy I tell you that, <laughs> that really came in handy to have one of those uh, collars around your neck uh, as like a pillow. Um, First of all, they would not let you use electronics, so my CD player and laptop computers, that was gone. You couldn't do that. What could you do? Well, you could eat four or five times. You could sleep. You could watch one of six movies, three in English, three in Chinese. And I want to tell you, this was horrendous. This was Air China. <laughs> no knock on Air China, but... Uh, uh, the movie. The first movie was an American movie, 1970s. The movie was called Cognac. Okay? I know you haven't heard it. I never saw it. Uh, it was terrible. So what we did is we got up, we walked around, we talked, went to the bathroom a million times, uh, ate a million times, tried to sleep. Uh, it was pretty tough. And, and as you see, we get off the plane in Shanghai after 13 hours. We really looked tough. From there, we managed to uh, spent two hours going through customs and immigration, got back on the plane, and then flew to another two hours to Beijing. So this was 15 hours of flying, and, it, and we looked at it. It was pretty tough. Well, now you know how we got here on a plane flying to China. In the next 15 days, we will see and visit with many interesting people and places. No wonder we came home with over 20 hours of video. So over the next several programs, we invite you to follow along with us as we bring you images of China on the other side of the world. Tiananmen Square, this is it. This is where it all happened. Um, if you remember in the video from the time of uh, the revolt, the tanks coming through the square and all that chaos, this is where it happened. And as we look off straight ahead, the entrance to the Forbidden City. Uh, again, a thing I, I just uh, am totally amazed at is uh, the fog, the mist, the pollution, actually. It's all coal, coal dust. Uh, automobiles, but mostly coal dust. Most everyone uses coal to fire up their stoves and, and, and uh, with the cyclists, uh, we understand that uh, they pay about 300 to 700 remy for our up top on all of the major political holidays here at Beijing. Uh, a lot of the party leaders were all s standing up on there as the military would come down through the boulevard with the tanks and soldiers in years past. Right there, Mongol, child, and mum. Tell by her rosy cheeks. It's now 10.20 in the morning on Monday. 
this is a very mild crowd of people. There aren't a lot of people here. It's just amazing how many people there are.